It's not a new story, but China has been relentlessly working to reclaim what much of the world had long considered lost. For decades, vast swathes of Chinese territory were devastated, with up to a quarter of China being dry, cracked, and unproductive land. It was a picture of complete abandonment. But today, everything has changed, and it's changed in ways no one expected, especially in agriculture. In the past, China barely produced enough meat to feed its own population. They lacked space, they lacked technology, they even lacked specialized personnel. Today, they not only produce what they consume, but they also export, and they export a lot. Do you know what they did? They built buildings for pigs. That's right, pigs living in high rises. In some regions of China, multi story buildings with air conditioning, hospital grade biosecurity, and total environmental control raise and process millions of pigs every year. Over there, robots tend to apples, kiwis, and grapes, using cameras and sensors with mechanical arms to harvest them without damage. They've released rabbits into the desert to regenerate vegetation, planted potatoes in hot sand, and even sent seeds into space, literally, to make them more resilient and boost crop yields back on Earth. But honestly, all of this is just a fraction of the project we're going to show you today. Because among all of China's incredible solutions, there's one that few people know about, and it might just be the most ambitious of all. Here, the problem wasn't desertification, a lack of water, or a shortage of space. The issue was something else entirely. Erosion. Mountainsides collapsing, soil turning to dust, rivers turning brown, families leaving because they couldn't plant or raise livestock anymore. To change the scenario, a giant project was born, capable of lifting millions out of poverty, reforesting entire mountains, and reclaiming one of the most battered regions in Asia. Want to know how this happened? Then come with me, because the story that's about to unfold is so unbelievable, it will make you rethink everything you thought you knew about what can be done with the earth. To understand this story, we need to take a trip to north-central China, more precisely to a region known as the Lus Plateau. This is a gigantic territory, covering nearly 270,000 square miles, spanning three entire provinces and touching four others, home to over 100 million people. For centuries, this place was the pride of the country. It was here that the first empires were born, the first plantations were established, and the earliest records of Chinese civilization emerged. The name, Lus, comes from the type of soil that dominates this area. It's a fine, yellowish powder, somewhat airy, even fertile, but it breaks apart too easily with wind and rain. And for millennia, people planted on the slopes, cut down trees, and used the land without thinking about the future. Eventually, the bill came due. The hillsides would crumble with any strong downpour. The land would turn to mud and wash straight into the rivers. The most significant of these is the legendary Yellow River, the Huang He, the second longest river in China. This river has always been considered the cradle of the nation, but it also earned another nickname, China's Sorrow. This is because it's one of the most flood-prone rivers in the world. And guess why? Because it's choked with sediment, coming precisely from the erosion of the Lus Plateau. Every gust of wind would lift and scatter dust, and with every rain, tons of soil would fall into the riverbed. The result was dense, thick, brown water that made the soil even more unstable. And when it overflowed, it swept everything away homes, roads, crops. Over the centuries, what was left was devastated land. Vegetation disappeared, and forests turned into ravines. Productive fields became dry slopes and valleys. And it all worsened when we remember that over 100 million people depended directly or indirectly on that ecosystem for survival. This was where their food, water, pasture, and livelihood came from. But the degradation was so severe that by the 1980s and 90s, it reached a point where living in the region became almost impossible. That's when the Chinese government realized they couldn't push the problem aside any longer. They either had to change everything, or in a few years, there would be no people, no land, and no river left. After watching the land crumble with the rain, wash down the hillsides, and clog the rivers with mud, the Chinese government understood that they couldn't leave things as they were. However, contrary to what many might imagine, this turnaround didn't begin with massive construction projects or supermodern machinery. It started with people, with conversations, 
with agreements. Instead of simply issuing orders or imposing rules, they went directly to those who understood that land best, the farmers. The conversation went something like this. If you agree to stop planting on the slopes, which only worsen erosion, and instead transform your farmlands into forests, we will provide you with food, financial assistance, and support to help you rebuild your lives on different land. It was a bold proposal, trading farmland for forests, crops for vegetation, depleted soil for greenery. In the beginning, of course, there was skepticism. After all, for many people there, planting on the edge of the ravine was the only way to make a living. It was what they knew. But little by little, with genuine incentives, things began to change. Those who accepted the exchange received enough grain to feed their families, plus a subsidy of about $300 yuan per acre. Converting that to US dollars, that would be roughly $40 per acre, though we haven't found precise data on Chinese inflation to give a more exact number. At the time, those 300 yuan likely had greater purchasing power. Furthermore, this aid could last from two to eight years, depending on the type of vegetation planted, whether it was a protective forest, a fruit orchard, or simply pasture to prevent erosion. Most importantly, no one lost ownership of their land. The land remained with the farmer, it simply gained a new purpose. But it wasn't just about putting down the hoe and being done. A package of new rules also came into play. Planting on very steep slopes was forbidden. Cutting down trees was no longer allowed. Letting goats and sheep roam free, ripping up roots? Absolutely not. The idea was to let the land heal and recover. With this, new methods began to emerge. Livestock herds were relocated, and the focus shifted. The emphasis became investing in higher value crops like apples walnuts, peaches, and peanuts, using well-planned terraces and sustainable management practices. Another crucial point was that they weren't meant to plant just anything to say they had reforested. Initially, they used commercial trees, but soon they began prioritizing native species and vegetation that adapted better to the dry climate, consumed less water, and held the soil more effectively. And this project wasn't based on guesswork. For 30 years, scientists, local authorities, World Bank technicians, and the residents themselves discussed everything collaboratively. Every adjustment was made based on the reality of each community. Slowly, the landscape began to transform. The once bare hillsides started to regain vegetation. The wind, which used to only stir up dust, now blew over grass, branches, and roots. And the land that seemed lost began to be. reborn. And then, my friends, China didn't stop. To grasp the scale of what happened there, you don't need metaphors or exaggeration. Just look at the numbers. Using these tactics, over 74 million acres across China were restored in less than 20 years. That's more than the entire area of the United Kingdom, a feat unmatched by any other country in the world. But what's most important is what these numbers truly represent. They show rivers that were dying have started flowing clean again. Hillsides that collapsed with every rainy season now hold their own weight. Thousands of families who had left because they could no longer farm are finally able to return. Vegetation brought stability, roots held the soil, and the soil, in turn, began to retain water. This created a virtuous cycle. More plants, more moisture, more insects, more life. The local climate became less dry the soil less hot, and the land more alive. And with the soil recovered, what was once abandonment became opportunity. New crops began to emerge. Fruits, oil seeds, high-value products in areas that previously barely managed half a corn harvest, now saw apple trees, walnut trees, and grapevines sprouting. As a result, family incomes increased by up to three times. Some communities even formed cooperatives and started selling directly outside their provinces. Money circulated, local commerce strengthened, and many young people who had left returned to work with their parents. What started as a seemingly simple subsidy evolved into a true rural development project. A comprehensive package that blended reforestation, technical assistance, land use reorganization, economic incentives, and environmental education, a model that began to be studied by scientists worldwide. 
But you know what the most impressive outcome was? Over 120 million people were directly impacted by this program. People who escaped extreme poverty, who gained income, access to education, and health care. All thanks to the land, or rather, the way the land began to be cared for. So, the question remains, if China could achieve this in one of Asia's most degraded regions, what else can it transform? Today, the Lus Plateau is no longer remembered solely as cracked, lifeless land. That region, battered by erosion, has become a showcase, an example, a destination for entire delegations from African, South American, and European countries, all eager to understand what China did there and how it was so successful. And it's no wonder. 30 million acres restored, over 200 million tons of soil saved from erosion, thousands of communities that returned to planting, harvesting, and living off the land with dignity. A territory that was on the verge of desertification became a benchmark in environmental recovery. A fresh start that didn't come from the top down, but involved the people, transformed their way of life, and completely reshaped the landscape. And it all began with a simple question, what can be done when everything seems lost? Instead of giving up, they tried. Of course, the Chinese context is specific. The scale, the structure, the mobilization capacity are unique. But the logic behind what happened there has a lot to teach us. Especially because erosion isn't just a problem in China, it's spread across the planet. In many places, we treat it as if it were a natural, inevitable consequence, but it's not. Imagine, for example, applying this kind of recovery to areas facing arid conditions, or to regions devastated by agricultural expansion, or even to those hillsides that constantly collapse during floods. It doesn't require cutting-edge technology, it requires organization, investment, and, most importantly, political will. And perhaps the most beautiful thing about this whole story is realizing that deep down, the earth has a memory, that it responds when it's well cared for, that even after years of mistreatment, it can bloom again, and that what seemed lost can be recovered. Did you know about this project? Did you know land could be recovered on this scale? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. What impressed you the most? Do you think a model like this could work elsewhere? And of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel, because here, we show you an incredible world that many people don't even imagine exists. Ready to discover another amazing transformation? Click on the screen right now to watch our next video and see what else is possible when we dare to dream big.